consumer goods uh, companies, specifically from the food industry. He regularly helps senior business leaders develop their growth strategies and business models. With more than 30 years of experience, Mr. Minard has held several management positions in sales and marketing. His conference, uh, named Horizon 2020 and a challenge of marketing poor, will be on the marketing of pork and the meat in a multi-channel context. KPMG offers a workshop that puts in the forefront innovation marketing. You'll be inspired by innovative model, model on the global scale in order for you to differentiate yourself. So without further ado, a good round of applause for Mr. Jean-Yves Menard. Thank you. Today we will be talking about innovation. Innovation applied to the pork sector. So, innovation driven pork marketing and global innovation models. We'll show you a few global innovation models. So, the first message I have for you is that oftentimes for our clients, innovation comes from other sectors uh, of the industry. It is then imported to your own sector. A few examples of this, well, you should try to translate them to the pork market and know that other industries innovated. Now how can this be applied to us? Next slide. In terms of innovation, it's no longer a buzzword. More than ever, it is a critical element in fueling business growth and maintaining market share. So all of our uh, customers, their growth and marketing objectives are clear. It goes from 15 to 20 percent of products that must come from innovation, meaning that revenue must include products that have been marketed in the last three years. This is not only for uh, goods, but also in the different sectors, in the food sector now, there's a lot of pressure for a price increase. Retailers systematically refuse price hikes, and innovation is for us, for a way for us producers to reach additional margins. Innovation. Well, let's not confuse it with invention. Uh, innovate. Innovation is uh, some twists in terms of the recipe, relaunching marketing. An invention is rather something that is truly, uh, that will change history, the course of history. So there are very few inventions and many more uh, innovations. Innovations are not enough for, uh, we need crea creativity, but also implementation. If there's no implementation, it is solely an idea. The big trend in marketing, well, before it was heavy, burdensome structures. We try to be perfect before launching a product. Now, the new trends in marketing are to try quickly. Uh, low cost attempts. If it is doomed, well, to try and attempt as long as it doesn't work. So this is the new way it works. Instead of having the perfect product, we try, introduce, modify, and improve gradually, and this is the path to success. In terms of innovation, how does Canada compare itself to the rest of the world? The most innovative countries are the Scandinavian countries, followed by the U.S. Canada ranks 12. Quebec is 8th in this, so better performance with regard to the average Canadian performance, but Ontario is 5th. We still have some progress to do. These figures come from all the industries, so this is not really specific to the food uh, service industry. But innovation here, the message is that you do not need to be a 
big country to innovate. It is a matter of culture and implementation. We'll see also through open innovation platforms how countries have integrated partners in the creation of innovation. First message, drivers of innovation, the number one is customers. They will quickly tell you what they like and what they do not like. It is up to us then uh, to look at the, uh, dry, uh, the um, discussion drivers, the social media to capture, capture trends uh, in uh, consumption and what they are looking for. Next slide. The more, the most structuring generation right now is millennials. Here's our definition of from boomers of the X generation and the millennials. Millennials were born. A bit, well, the X generation is between 65 and 80, and the Y and Z generation are the millennials. They are born after 1980. So, in 2010, they represented five percent of the population, of the American population rather. They will represent 20% of the US population in 2020. So they are the ones coming up with the uh, purchase power. Their average salary right now in the US is at $28,000. Their average income will be $45,000 within the next five years. Also interesting fact, it's the first time in marketing that a generation that has a low purchase power called the millennials influence the X and Y generation in terms of trends, especially in the food sector. I have a statistics here on monthly consumption for restaurants, $174 for millennials in the US versus $153 for the uh, X and um, uh, the baby boomers generations. Yep. Already the manuals are ready to spend a lot more in terms of food, oh, which they have to cut somewhere else, and also the influence of the Generation Xs and the Boomer Generation in the popular trends with regard to restaurants and other trends. One attempt has been made regarding uh, food retail in the U.S., which is Whole Foods, who voluntarily launched a type of store is called 365 and it's particularly focused on targeting millennials and there's a lot of technology inside the store and the source of the products the fair trade products and all the different values that the millennials hold dear are incorporated into this uh, test market i call it a test market because as i mentioned already instead of having a major uh, launch of 365 for a company like Whole Foods is just doing a little test market in a certain number of locations to feel out their reaction and if it doesn't work then they'll adjust it right away before they move on to something else. So these are some of the major marketing trends now. The next slide. So at the moment with regard to the trends in the food sectors we face some trends that are very fragmented and quite paradoxical and as you'll see we're going to have a look at the metro advertisement where they try to capture all these trends so the positioning of the ad has more to do with opportunities to consume rather than a specific segment compared to some like IGA that will tend to push towards high quality and high end here they talk about buying opportunities in Metro, there's something for everybody. This is perfect because there are many different Eric's. There's Eric who likes to cook and the one who likes to explore. And there's the Eric who likes to take his time and the Eric who never has any time. And there's the uh, chic Eric and the one who likes fast food and the exerciser and the lazy guy. And so there are all different types. And uh, that's why all of Quebec comes to Metro because there's something for everybody. That's why Metro is my grocer. So you can see once again the trends where they try to reach out to different segments based on opportunities of consumption and also to address the ambiguity of consumers in choosing. They want to stay healthy, they want to buy themselves a good meal, they want to exercise but at the same time they want to have some leisure time 
So this ad tries to capture these new trends. So another trend we're going to continue along with the four trends that we saw. So from a, in terms of practical nature and speed and convenience, and we have these are the four trends that we've decided to talk to about with you. Why? Well, speed and convenience. More than 52% of Canadians now take less than 15 minutes in preparing a meal. So the major traditional meals that people have at home is something that is changing. There are a lot of people who live in couples or alone. And so speed and convenience, people take less time to eat as well. And as a result, capturing that trend is important not only for industries, but particularly in the pork, prepared pork in a recipe. People no longer buy the meat, they'll buy a recipe and inside it, the pork will be provided. The new protein, the trend nowadays is 50% of the opportunities consumed come from what we call snacking. 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. We'll talk about that a bit later on. The uh, breakfast, is the opportunity for food which is now taking over from the traditional lunch. And one of the trends that we see is that people will take a lot of breakfast, a big breakfast is growing 7% in the last nine years and for the rest of the day people will snack instead of sitting down in order to have a proper meal at lunch or dinner. So this is changing the way things are being presented in terms of opportunities for consumption for pork. The good news on this is that already at breakfast, all pork derivatives are pr quite highly present in the kinds of food chosen for breakfast. Flexitarianism. This is a bit less the case for pork. It's a bit less uh, an opportunity in the case of pork because there are trends for vegetarianism and there are people who are flexible. In other words, they reduce their the, uh, occasions when they eat meat. However, they're not against having a, a meal with some meat sometime during the week. So you have to be able to capture or tie into that opportunity. And the last trend we're going to talk about is the digital consumer. A digital consumer historically, as I already mentioned, in terms of the major trends of millennials are coming out with purchasing power that is quite substantial and they make a decision. So historically, digital consumption was being limited to uh, loyalty programs and what we call couponing. In other words, online discounts that could be offered. And in the future, digital consumption will be present in terms of the information that people will be able to obtain instantaneously. The client will be able to get the source of the protein, the source location of the product, how to prepare it for a meal, what the price is, and so forth. So the information is going to be a lot more substantial, the amount of information available for a consumer in connection with the food item. So how can the swine industry take advantage of these trends? We'll take a look at that with some specific examples. Once again, you'll see that there are some examples that are a bit far-fetched. However, as I mentioned at the start, today's trends involve trying. If it works, then we, re we adjust. And if it doesn't work, then we move out of that sector. So the first of these is the growing change in lifestyles with consumers who have less and less time. As I mentioned, 52% of Canadians take less than 15 minutes to consume it. And the future success will depend on the capacity to offer solutions in terms of meals. And once again, we, people don't consume meat, they consume a meal that pork will be part of or some other protein. The first example is ASDA, which won the silver prize in the UK for its no preparation needed slow cooker line of products. So you have vegetables, spices, the meat, which can be pork, and you simply put it into your slow cooker with a bit of water and then that's all you have to do. And the trends, if you think this is an isolated trend, 
these companies are being acquired or shares are being bought by General Mills and other large companies and manufacturers. So these are major trends. Moy Park is an example. This is another system. This one will go more directly with the roast pork in the bag that goes directly in the oven. Not only does it cook, but it keeps the gravy in, and the technology is such that if you want to have it roasted, then that forms part of the cooking method. So you come home, and all of a sudden your meal is ready while you are out doing something else. And one of the things that was not even being talked about 10 years ago is meal kits. We're not talking about a box lunch, we're talking about a meal kit where you have a meal ready to cook or ready to serve or ready to compose at home. So, of course, pork does fit into this type of initiative. Is it a major opportunity? Yes, it's huge. That's the answer. The leader in this sector is Blue Apron. This is a company which, after three years of existence, we're not talking about 30 years, Two business, uh, two billion in business volume. So, its positioning is high end. The meal arrives ready, including the protein, which can be pork, and all you have to do is prepare it and serve it at home. So, the important thing to keep in mind here is that within five years, the U.S. market alone will grow tenfold. So, companies like this, this is a, these are Canadian companies, Good Food and Cook It. We see a lot of new players entering the market. Some of them will stay, others will be bought up, bought out, others will close. But these were not the trends we used to see. So in terms of a strategy for pork, the point is how to make sure that you're part of those recipes that these companies use. We can call it third-party marketing solution. Once again, another far-fetched idea, but that is being tested out, in this case in Paris, the butcher, Florence and Michel, there's a lot of demand for their products, and they wanted to make the product available 24 hours a day for the consumers, so they decided to set up uh, an automatic vending machine of different meats, including pork, beside their store. You can pay with a blue card or credit card, and for the time being, it's being tested. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's one initiative. So another initiative, which is a little bit more uh, attractive, which is distribution centers in cities such as London, Paris, or Berlin, which make it possible for you to go and pick up your meat directly through a distribution center that is available in urban areas. Of course, these our tests five or ten years ago, this is not something that we could see. Five or ten, five years ago, people said that clothing would never be sold online, and now you see major players involved. So you have to be watchful about this. They are trying out these methods, but some of these concepts may very well succeed. Talking about a new concept that is being tested out, it's the frozen butcher. So these are frozen products that are deep frozen to preserve the texture and flavor, and the main innovation in this is it's distributed directly to you by UPS everywhere in Canada within 48 hours. So, of course, there's an ice pack which protects the uh, deep frozen meat, but a few years ago this is a concept that would not be considered. As far as breakfasts are concerned, I touched on this earlier, the increasing popularity of uh, breakfast on the go. So, of course, it's an opportunity for manufacturers of food products and retailers and operators. In 2014, more than 12.5 billion uh, visits to re restaurants were made at breakfast in the U.S., a 3% gain over one year. And in 10 years, we're talking about a 9% gain, and the same trend is seen in Canada. Breakfast is becoming, uh, it's really taking over compared to other meals, and it's followed by uh, snacking. So for the breakfasts, this is promising for pork, for snacking, we'll show you some other opportunities. 
to include pork meat in the snacking, it's quite feasible. So the new protein, not only for gym junkies, protein-enriched snacks and foods are gaining in popularity due to their perceived benefits to internal health as well as external appearance. Snacks as meal replacements are a growing opportunity. We're talking about 50% of consumption opportunities now which involve snacking. Snacking, of course, with a health twist to it rather than junk food. One example in meats is that a business volume of Crave went from 17 million in 2013 to 36 million in 2015. 46% growth. And Crave is now offering its jerky to athletes with uh, rich protein because of little amounts of fat, not very much fat in it. So pork can be used in a jerky concept from a snacking viewpoint. So this again is another way, a way of giving people another opportunity to consume pork. Next slide, there's another one here which is even more far-fetched. The Epic Bars. Epic Bars have revenues that tripled uh, to 6.8 million in 2014 and then tripled again to 20 million in 2015 in one year. So the big news is that you can see that pork is included. We're talking about a mix of nuts, raisins, and various berries. And pork has a strong presence in this kind of snacking. And the question is, is this really a a strong underlying trend or just a distraction. General Mills acquired Epic for nearly 100 million in 2016 and they think it's a strong trend. So these uh, power bars or food bars can include uh, pork and all the better because pork is a protein source. So this is a tra strong trend that is developing. So another trend that is a bit less favorable to us in the pork sector is flexitarianism. We can see trends toward vegetarianism. However, more and more people are being flexible in the sense that they'll reduce their meat consumption per se, which is an underlying trend, and they'll reduce the number of meals with meat. However, when they have meat, well, when they're ready to eat meat, that's when we have to attract them, either through recipes or, or through some uh, product choice available with uh, that is a good alternative for them. This is something we're looking at. Now, with regard to adaptations, here's a company in Europe called Heck, and they have said that if, we don't, if they don't buy meat, they'll buy something else. So either cheese or vegetarian products, and they've decided to diversify in that sector. So the important thing to keep in mind here is Consumers do not buy meat, they buy what they can make with it. So that it's the type of meal that they can have, and then the decision to take a certain type of meat fits in as part of that decision-making process, rather than buying a chicken or a piece of pork roast and deciding what to do with it afterwards during the week. Well, the decision is going to be more individualistic in terms of what meal the person will have and uh, pr uh, ready to eat or easy to prepare. And then the type of protein involved that they will use, well, that fits in as part of the solution. So once again, these are examples of diversification. Perhaps it doesn't apply in our industry, but there are people who clearly stated that they're involved in preparing foods and meat, and there are other ways of consuming burgers, for example. So. This forms part of the products that are non-animal products or non-meat products. So they decided to uh, buy a 5% stake in uh, the Beyond Burger. It's distributed at Walmart and other retailers in the UK and the United States. Will this be a success? Is this a strong strategy of diversification rather than concentrating on animal proteins? Well. That's one big question. But once again, as I explained earlier, people are more daring rather than you know, pulling out quickly if it doesn't work. 
they dare to diversify and to capture the whole full range of the plate of the consumer. So regarding trend number four, the digital consumer, historically speaking, when we talked about uh, digital, it's a loyalty building program, and we talked about couponing and discounts that people can uh, obtain with a coupon at the cash. Increasingly, technology has formed part of our buying decision making at the retail level. So we compare prices, people compare, people go and see what recipes are available. They will look at the source of the product, local consumption. This is one thing that is favorable for pork. And increasingly, people look at the source and the location and, for example, import from other parts of the world, the U.S. or Canada. They try to eat locally. That is a trend. And of course, eating locally, uh, not at any price. The other components have to be considered. But certainly, there is a trend, uh, an increasing trend to eat locally. So once again, this is a bit repetitive, this one, but uh, it's not so much, there is no digital strategy anymore, just a strategy in a digital world. So before people use uh, did, uh, technology for loyalty programs and things like that. Now the digital and information environment is part of our day-to-day uh, -day world when people make a decision to consume in f terms of food, whether it's to go to a restaurant or at the retail level or at home or now, as you can see, there are trends in terms of distribution of ready-to-serve meals or quite simply purchases of food products using the web. Another application that is being tested out in 2015, Foodster, which is quite easy. You uh, make a choice where you twin together a recipe and grocery store deals. So you can choose between your favorite retailers where you want to shop, and then when you acquire the the item, whether it's a pork roast or a cutlet, right away it's going to explain how to do it, and it will tell you where to buy it at the best price. So in terms of the industry, we have to get our foot in the door in terms of these trends. Another example here is in 2016, the Chinese brand Xiaomi launched an app that helps you track cooking rice. I, that looks a bit uh, exaggerated, but these are some of the underlying trends. So you can monitor the cooking of your roast at a distance. So you can connect up your, product, your preparation of the pork with a recipe. You can check where it's on special this week. And once again, this is part of the digital environment in which we are going to be living uh, over the next five years. Innovation helps you. This is a major trend. In the past, companies had what we call the development of new products, which were secret and which were isolated. And the fight was the time to market, the time between having an idea and putting it on the market, which varied from 12, 24 to 36 years, depending on the degree of innovation. That has changed now. Increasingly, the major leaders, such as Procter & Gamble, Cargill, and Mars, Mars the innovation is open, so they deal with partners, clients, suppliers, and so on, consumers to generate new ideas for marketing and for the trends in new products. And the result of this is that in Procter & Gamble, just to give you an example, it's their efficiency, which is measured by the number of products that are brought to market and that succeed went up from 50%, went up by 50% in recent years. It's a platform. They, the big companies have decided to be more open in terms of innovation, get the universities and suppliers to participate, and enable customers to participate through various technology platforms. And this gives them a pool of new ideas, 
and a speed of execution they did not have in the past. So this is a trend which we are observing, and not only in that industry, but frequently we see suppliers sitting at the table of a retailer to try to bring out some innovative ideas, either in private brands or in ways of marketing the category in which they're operating. So in conclusion, innovation is very good in theory, but one has to be aware that in terms of startups, 75% of all startups fail. So that's normal. In when we want to talk about innovating, one mustn't be afraid of the unknown, and one must be aware of the fact that innovating, seven or eight times out of 10, the final product will be very different from what was imagined at the start for various reasons. And regarding startups and business innovation, there are seven practical startup, startup tips that you can use to help improve your business innovation. And they're on the next page. The first thing is how to draw from startups innovation practices for the pork sector for innovation. The first thing is think big and follow your vision. So it's easy to say, but for practical applications, well, we have one, not in your field, but if you go to the site of uh, the chocolate company Favori, if you see their ambition is to reconquer the world in terms of the chocolate and redefine the category. So that is, if that isn't thinking big, I don't know what is. And they take the means to do it right now. So placing the customer first. So always think not in terms of the production limits, but in terms of what the consumer wants and how to achieve that. Also look at the channels of distribution, how consumers go about it, how they w do or will consume, or from whom or with whom they will consume products. And this is the most important one. Fail fast and fail cheaply. Fail fast, fail forward, and fail better. So that's the major trend. Instead of waiting to have the perfect uh, dive, you dive in, then you start over again, and you improve as you go along. And ultimately, you get the right winning recipe or if not, you'll have to move out of that market. These are the trends that have been raised in terms of the technology where we know that the software was often launched and it had to be updated as the marketing process went on. And this applied to a number of industries and it's now part of the DNA of 2020 marketing. Form a smaller team, oh, co collaborate internally and externally, sorry. Innovation, is, it's not invention, it's not only a small group internally who decide to launch a new product within the next 12 to 24 months. It's a form of sharing externally with your uh, suppliers, consumers, and internally in R&D uh, for marketing and also for sales. Form smaller teams, so agility is necessary. Instead of trying to have the absolute one number one best product that comes up every 10 years. Innovation can involve small changes in the way you do things, and agility comes with small teams rather than have major cumbersome processes that go through various stage gates that are bureaucratic in nature. Do more with less. So in other words, the major trends that we've seen with 365 People don't hesitate to test them out quickly to see if it works, even if it means uh, pulling their chestnuts out of the fire quickly if it doesn't work, rather than going through with a major in-depth analysis on what might happen with all the different alternatives. And the most important, put technology at the heart of the business. So the technology at the moment is central to all the development platforms, and it's going to be even more so. We don't know what will happen, but we know that it's going to be a game changer. So this pretty well concludes the innovation. The last slide is innovation is not the only factor in success. So in operational terms, it's important for operations to be validated, flexibility. So if it doesn't work, be flexible enough and efficient enough to change direction. 
reliability, quality, and of course, speed to market, your agility to quickly launch it. We can see in, a, in the case of our customers, the first one that launches a new product often gets a market share, which we call premium, which is between five or 10 percent permanently because they were first to launch. So it's very hard when you're number two or number three to catch up to the performance of the leader in an innovation. So that concludes the presentation. I'll be happy to entertain a few questions now. Merci. Si, uh, si lien. If we can uh, make a link with uh, the presentation that I uh, gave earlier, we can see a trend towards fresh meat that we will be, be prepared at home with recipes. And I see how my children uh, go towards this trend in that regard. And the uh, meat industry, we try to adapt to the offer. Uh, but the future of the meat market for the traditional meat uh, industry, uh, where is it going? Answer, well, we're talking about the uh, health factor in, in daily meats, right? Well, we are not worried in the sense that, well, we don't know if this will be strongly growing in terms of segment, but we know one thing. People will still uh, eat daily meat moderately. Maybe not as an is not a huge segment, but I was mentioning chocolate here. Well, chocolat favori, the chocolate maker. Well, you know, in terms of calories, it's hard to uh, to to have anything higher than that. But there's a big trend in 2016, and especially millennials. We noted that they are ready to exercise for a couple of hours in order to get their uh, ice cream or dairy chocolate. So for deli meats, there clearly is, there's an attraction for that kind of product that will last. It might be maybe more, uh, consume more moderately rather than being part of a daily lifestyle. And Quebec, it is not as apparent as some regions in France where uh, it is part of the daily uh, routine. So, vegetarian meals, they are gaining some traction, but we'll see that there's a balance. You see, it's a matter of balance. Any other questions? I have more of a general question here. I was looking at the Last Sunday, I made a mistake to go to Costco. It was worse than Boxing Day. So I wondered if wholesale will still be applied to millennials who might be more interested in uh, personalized products. Answer. Costco's success is undeniable. in the food sector, they uh, attract a uh, higher consuming, let's say the average uh, uh, basket, food basket is uh, higher in Costco. We go there for treasure hunt, for example, if we see a product, whether it is food or not. Well, we don't know if it will be there in a couple of weeks, so that's how they attract innovation. The way they attract members uh, or clients is through membership. I think it's 80% of membership that is renewed every year. They do this through innovation. They put on the floor limited products, limited availability products, and uh, historically, Costco's packaging is that providers, providers had to come up with something different than what they sold at Metro Sobe's or uh, Provigo to have a uh, something special for Costco. This trend is still present. Millennials will also have children, so in certain sectors, Costco might be very present for the food sector. Well, we'll see. 
Now, on the other spectrum of the millennials, baby boomers, they're the empty nesters. What do we call it? Once the kids are raised, they are they live by themselves. They will live longer. This they clearly going to Costco. You know, it would be hard to to see and to uh, to see for them. So they might uh, consume more in isolation to lower waste and adapt their f uh, food. Their uh, their food. So if you're by yourself, you want to enjoy your meal. Will not also over consume to for this meal. With regard to Costco, uh, we'll see in the future. They will be opening 70 stores in the U.S., 8 in Canada. They have a strong trend. They adapt also. There's uh, business Costco, the B2B. These are distribution networks that should not be under underestimated and are grabbing market shares with regard to uh, the more traditional distribution networks. Thank you very much. Oh, there is one question over there. Question. In your presentation, do millennials grant importance to everything that is anti antibiotics free, that is green, is sustainable? So, do they? Uh, what importance do they uh, give to this? Well, in theory, answer in theory, they of course give a lot of importance to this. We see through research that um, they do not like the way that baby boomers have consumed and the way that they are leaving the state of the planet. This has some influence in the fact, well, they play 20-25% more. Well, there is no answer right now, and I'll tell you why. Millennials are full of paradox. For clothing, you look at the Gucci handbag, but you go at Joe Fresh to grab a five or ten dollar uh, blouse. So, where's the parallel in this? For food, they won't hesitate getting a two hundred dollar meal for a couple, but at the same time, they will look for rebates at Metro or IGA. So they are full of paradox. In terms of responsibility, they will look at information and digital information will help them to see if this is a fair trade product, if it is good for health, whether it was produced as part of the value chain, has there been any products uh, or problems rather, if children, is there was uh, child labor in the production of, the, of this product. So uh, they fact check instantaneously. And yes, they might be w more willing to pay a little more to ensure that they will support a product that is uh, in line with their values. But uh, up to where? Up 20% uh, more? Well, they will tell you, but in reality, uh, when it comes down to consuming, it's a different thing. But this is the generation to keep in mind here and to keep track of. Not, not to insult the baby boomer generation, or but the Y generation is the one that will influence it to that, that are that is influencing it to others. Great, thank you very much. Donc les conférences de Monsieur Fournier, Mr. Fournier's and Menard's conferences will be available in PDF and video. The documents will be available on the Pork Show's website and the conference section. For the next part, we will resume at 3.30 in the same room. So maybe just uh, stand up and uh, to uh, change room, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.